Welcome to my channel. This is an indication of some of the things that I cover on a regular basis in my videos. If you haven't already subscribed, please feel free to do so. And don't forget to click the little bell so that you'll get notified of future videos. Please feel free to share my videos on your social media. And I hope you enjoy the video which follows. Well, hello everybody. I'm going to make basically the same sourdough bread that you've seen me make before, but with a much simpler method. I've been watching videos from an Irish baker, Patrick Ryan. Um, his channel is I Love Baking Ireland. And that's, you know, no, no spaces, all one great big long word. Anyway, I will put a link up to his video in one of the end screen things at the end of, the end of this video. But the, the method that I have been using all along has been, well, a number of steps and he has his down to basically two steps it doesn't there's no quicker because uh, sourdough yeast sourdough leavener is a, a wild yeast and it's very slow to react and, and to rise but but there's much less involvement with the with the baker anyway you you are waiting a couple of times for a few hours but there isn't very much that you have to have to do in between and I kind of like it. I have used his method now twice. This is a Banatone proofing basket. I guess that's what they call rattan. And it has a linen liner. I've only used it once. And even with the linen liner, you're supposed to get some of this definition on your, on your loaf. It's supposed to press down in, and, and uh, it did not, <laughs> at any rate, giving it one more try. You can uh, use it without the linen liner, but uh, I think without it would be more apt to, to stick. The dough would be more apt to stick, or you'd have to use a lot more flour, and you'd end up with a loaf that was covered in flour. But anyway, that's for tomorrow. I'm going to be using that, so... We hope it works better this time it did the other times, whether or not it, uh, it uh, actually produces the ridges isn't all that important as long as we get a good loaf out of it, I guess. That's 10 ounces of my sourdough starter. It's been out of the refrigerator for mm, probably a couple of hours. You can see it's already started to bubble again. It's a good strong starter. And just this is zero back to, to nothing, but that's 10 ounces. And to that I'm going to add 10 ounces of flour. Uh, with my starter, I just use all-purpose flour. All-purpose white flour. You can use any flour that you want. But that's how I do it, I guess. I stopped the camera for a minute or two there. I haven't done anything else or added any more. I couldn't get over how quickly it was going up on the scale. And then I looked closer. It was in grams, not ounces. So My flour isn't as heavy as I thought it was. And we have 10 ounces of flour, back to zero, and 10 ounces of just tap water. And I'm not even tepid, just cold tap water is what I prefer to use. I'll need 16 ounces of this in the morning, so. Point two, that'll do, I guess. I just stir this up to incorporate everything in together the starter that was already there, and the flour, and the added water. And I will cover this and just leave it set aside overnight at, uh, at room temperature here in the kitchen. And in the morning, it should probably have at least doubled before I knock it back down again and use some of it. I've been using it fairly frequently lately, so it is 
it is a fairly strong starter right now. It's, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. So, I don't mean in flavor, I just mean in strength. And the yeast activity, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So, I will see you in the morning when we carry on with this little exercise. Well, good morning, everybody. This more than doubled in bulk, I think. Actually, it started to settle back a little now. It's nice and active. I need 16 ounces of the starter. I'll try to leave that so you could see the scale, and I've taken it out of the way, haven't I? Well, I don't even know if that's in focus, but we will see. Knock this down first. Some of the air out of it. It's a nice active culture. There's about half of what I need already. And that is pretty close. Just a little bit over. That's good. Now the the uh, culture here doesn't have to be fed immediately. If you're going to use it within the next week, this can just be covered and put back in the refrigerator now. And if you don't use it, you take it out a week later and, and feed it anyway. It is definitely a living thing. Well, there was the 16 ounces and I need 14 ounces of water. This is just water straight out of the tap. Using my favorite brand here, Robin Hood. Uh, that's the French side here. Robin Hood multigrain bread flour. And if you're going to make either a multigrain or a whole wheat, and you're going to use just one flour to do it, you have to make sure that it is called a bread flour or a bread blend. If this was just straight multigrain, it would be too heavy. Um, it says here it's a blend of flours, cracked wheat, cracked rye, and whole flax seed. By blend, they mean that it has got probably whole wheat flour in it as well as a strong um, white bread flour. And it's, de it's designed to um, be used to make bread with. If you can't find a product like that wherever you live, I would either take the whole wheat or the multigrain and blend it with uh, a good strong white bread flour. Probably initially, I, the first time you try it, maybe 50-50, but I think you can probably use a higher ratio. I don't know if King Arthur in the, in the U.S. has uh, I'm after 24 ounces here, by the way. King Arthur in the U.S. has a blended bread flour or not. They seem to be the, the favorite flour by most Americans. And they do have a, a great range. on the stand mixer and we'll start making the bread. Now well, here's the first place where this particular method deviates from what I was doing previously. Normally with the recipe that I was following that was mostly from King Arthur, 
you would now mix these ingredients just until they were blended and then uh, take the bowl off, cover it with plastic wrap and let it rest for 20 minutes before you added the salt and, and did the regular the, the rest of the kneading. Well this one you just do it all at once and this, it sort of carries on doing things all at once as, as, we, as we go on here. It eliminated a, a lot of the steps that I was doing and the bread seems to work as far as I can tell just as well as it ever did. Uh, that was two teaspoons of salt. I'm using a sea salt but you could use any any salt, two teaspoons of salt. And now we'll knead this for at least 10 minutes. At 10 minutes I'll come back and uh, see whether or not it is finished or needs to be kneaded for a bit longer. And that again is using the, the new method that uh, Patrick Ryan has demonstrated on his, his videos. This is only a couple of minutes into the kneading, but it has come together nicely into a ball there. So it is being well kneaded. I suspect 10 minutes will probably be enough. Sometimes the dough seems to be wetter. Uh, this morning it seems to have come together quite quickly. I thought this thing would beep longer than that. That's why I had you looking at it. <laughs> sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. If you don't have something like this, it's a good, a good little purchase if you're doing any baking, particularly bread. Um, I don't know what I paid for it, nothing much. This particular brand name is called Time Stick, but it's just a little timer. It goes around your neck on this lanyard, if you can see that. And I wear it all day when I'm making bread. I just keep setting it for the different time settings that I need. And it lets me know when it's time to move on and do another step. Well, I will get the bread out of the mixer here. It's been doing its full 10 minutes. And we'll see whether or not it's ready or if it needs a little hand kneading. I'm going to put a little oil. I'm using olive oil. Any oil will do, I guess. On my hands so the dough won't stick to me. Let's see if we can get it out of here. watch Patrick Ryan's video this is the test that he does to see whether or not the dough has been kneaded enough unfortunately the light is on the wrong side of this but I can stretch it very thinly which means you would be able to see light through through that sort of window there and that indicates that the dough has formed enough gluten if it, if it wasn't ready it would sort of be sagging and, and falling apart at this point because you can even see my finger through it there so that's a good sign. Ten minutes was enough on this particular one. Now all I have to do is shape this into a ball. Put it back in the bowl. For the, it's first of two risings. Um, and this one is three hours long. During that time, the uh, flour will finish hydrating, so that it will, it will still be soft, but not as tacky as it is now. And it goes just at room temperature in a relatively warm location, wherever your warmest location is this time of year. For three hours. Well, the next little clips that follow here, while this is doing its rising. We'll explain what I'm thinking I want to do. Hopefully you're interested. 
I have decided to see if anybody's interested in having some sourdough culture. If you watched my previous video, two or three videos back, three or four videos back, where I rehydrated uh, some, uh, dear, still getting messages here, I rehydrated some of my um, starter that had been dried and in the freezer for nine months and it worked very well. Well, the next little clips will explain what I'm what I'm up to, and if you're interested, I'll provide you with some uh, sourdough starter, free of charge. I would offer you some uh, sourdough starter, free. If you saw my video, oh, I don't know, three videos ago, four videos ago, where I reconstituted dried. Um, sourdough starter, my sourdough starter. I had dried it and put it in the freezer for nine months and brought it out and and uh, reconstituted it. And I'll show you in that video how to do that. And it worked beautifully. I got a, a very strong culture back out of it in well, three or four days, I think is about all it took. So anyway, if you are interested, this is what I've been doing. I have This is sourdough culture that I spread out on parchment paper. Oh, um, I don't know. I think less than a week ago, but I wanted to make sure it was thoroughly dry, so I've had it uh, sitting on my dining room table covered with a clean tea towel so that dust wouldn't get on it or anything. And now I'm wearing it up and making a powder. And I'll show you in a minute here how I do that, and then I'll show you what I plan to, to give you if you're interested. It's now in my ancient blender. That's ground up pretty well, but I will still grind it further. This is what the finished product looks like. I find it. Something here to keep my fingers out of it. And I will show you how much I plan to send you. I have these little Ziploc bags, and I don't know, I didn't accurately measure that one, but it's probably a rounded teaspoon full of the powder, which should be more than enough to get your sourdough culture going. <laughs> I've already had, I thought of it myself, and then I had someone else joke with me online. Uh, that's if you're not afraid of receiving a white powdered substance in the mail. You know, how many times in the past have places been closed down because of a white powdered substance in the mail? I will put it in a secure envelope uh, and I will attach it to a sheet of paper with an explanation of what it is. So if, if nobody should get into any problems there. There's no law against white powdered substances. It's the, the lethal ones that there's a law against, and I will have an explanation as to what is in the envelope just in case something should happen to it. But a flat pack like that in an envelope well sealed shouldn't be any problem. I will send this anywhere on the globe. I'll limit it to 50. I'll do 50 packets. Probably will never get a demand for, for 50 of them, but I'm saying limiting it to 50 because postage here is very expensive. Um, you'd send it within Canada in Canadian money it's like a dollar and five cents with the taxes and goes up higher when I send it to the US and higher still when it goes somewhere else in the world so I'll do 50 of them uh, I don't know if I have enough powder here to do the first 50 but I'll keep going until this runs out and make more if I need to so I would hesitate to suggest that you put your mailing address in one of the comments. Um, if you feel safe doing that, go for it, and I'll, I'll write your address down, and then I'll delete your comment so that it won't be there. But below the video in the description of uh, the bread making method and whatever, I'll give you an email address, one that I is mine, but I, I never use the thing, so I'm not worried about it being out there. And you send me an email with a postal address, and, I'll, and I will, your name and postal address, whatever, and, I'll, and I will send this to you. Um, 
If I don't, I will reply to, my plan would be to reply to that email as soon as I receive it. If you don't get a reply, uh, it might mean that your email went into a spam folder because you're not in my address book or whatever. So if you don't get a reply in a day or so, um, put another comment on uh, on YouTube and we'll try it again. I'll check the spam folder frequently. If you put uh, sourdough culture in your in your subject line of your email, it makes it easier to find. There always seems to be a lot of spam junk that gets taken out automatically from my accounts, but occasionally if, if somebody isn't uh, in my address book, they end up in the spam folder too. Anyway, that is the plan. If you want to try sourdough culture and you don't have one and don't want to try making your own from scratch or buying one, I will gladly give you a little envelope of, of mine and uh, hope you have success with it. I'll also, at the end of the video here, I will put up uh, an end screen to the video of when I reconstituted this uh, in case you haven't already seen it. Well, that is that. Let's move on. Well, the three hours are almost up. It's time to lightly flower the proofing basket here, the linen in the proofing basket anyway. Try to prevent the, the dough from sticking. probably do. Hope it will anyway. Well, it just finished its three hours of rising in a warm location. And it has increased in bulk a fair amount. I never seem to get the kind of a rise that you would get if you were using regular yeast though, so I don't ever expect that. I guess I've never had it, so I don't think it'll ever happen. trying to do now is to increase the surface tension and you do that by folding it over on itself but not coming into the center going beyond the center and coming over very pleased that I haven't had to use any extra flour both both times that I've had this out of the bowl you don't want to incorporate any more flour if it unless it's absolutely necessary. So it's getting quite firm. And you finish the shape by dragging it on the board. That sort of tucks everything in underneath. <laughs> My board moves on me here. Now this goes in the proofing basket upside down, the folded side facing up because you're going to turn it out when you go to bake it and that will the presentation side will be the smooth side that's down below. Now it gets covered with a tea towel and it should also be sprinkled with flour first if I could find it here. Again I'm just using the white all-purpose flour for this. But A liberal coating of flour for the top of it just so it won't uh, stick to the tea towel hopefully it won't hopefully it won't anyway and the tea towel I have dampened it it's not wet but it's damp all of this both the flour and the tea towel dampened is to try to prevent the surface from drying out and it will go back in that warm location for three and a half hours. At the three hour point you preheat the oven and the Dutch oven, the cast iron Dutch oven that I'll bake it in. I bake my breads in the Dutch oven if you watch uh, uh, the Irish baker's video there. Uh, he did one in a Pyrex casserole 
which is kind of a different way of doing it. And it worked for him very well. But I like the idea of the Dutch oven being preheated because then you get that oven spring when you put this in and put the cover on the steam that comes out of the bread causes it to to really do a quick rise in the in the oven so I'll bring you back when I'm ready to turn this out and uh, slash it and put it in the oven well it's had its three and a half hour rising and the oven is at 450 degrees Fahrenheit it's 230 degrees Celsius Now to see if I can get it out of the mold. <laughs> Only the second time I've ever attempted this, and what I did the last time worked, so I'm going to go with it again. A piece of parchment paper, because that's how I put it in the in the Dutch oven. I use the parchment paper. It's risen a little bit above, so it's going to knock it down some, I guess. Here's hoping it doesn't go on the floor. Badly is it? No, not stuck at all. Well, a little bit, but nothing much. Once again, I don't see where I'm going to get any of the the pattern from the from the basket. But anyway, such is life. Maybe the next time I make bread, I'll get brave and try it without the uh, linen lining. Let's move over to the stove and slash this and get it in the Dutch oven. I know from trial and error, I guess, how I discovered it anyway, that uh, this takes 45 minutes with the cover on, the Dutch oven, and another 10 to 15 minutes with the cover off to brown it, so close to an hour. It's a large loaf. You could scale it down if you wanted to and make a smaller one. But Now, you can cut any pattern that you want to cut into the top, uh, two or three slashes as stripes or a square or I attempt to do a triangle. It doesn't mean that I'm always successful at it. I do the triangle because I have seen in a magazine how neat it looked when it came out of the oven. <laughs> Mine's never looked like that yet though. Well, let's get it in the Dutch oven. show you what it looks like in an hour's time. Well, there is the finished product, I guess. It certainly rose after it went in the oven. And the slash really helps it. I just wish I had some of the design from the basket. <laughs> Next time I make bread, I'm going to be brave and not use the linen. I will let this cool completely, and then I'll bring you back when I cut it in half and see what the interior looks like. I normally, well, I was cutting them in half and freezing one half, and lately I've been cutting it in quarters and freezing three quarters of it and when I want more bread I take one quarter out. It freezes very well is what I'm trying to say anyway and this is a very large loaf. I uh, don't know exactly what it would weigh but it's a, it's a large loaf, probably larger than you would find in in most bakeries anyway. So I'm back when it's time to cut this thing in two and see what it looks like inside. Well it has cooled almost completely I guess. Cut it in two and see what the interior looks like. Hmm. Not bad. 
I don't tend to get the large bubble type holes in the multi-grain bread that you get if you're doing white and I don't that often do white I tend to do more multi-grain and whole wheat I guess but it's a nice soft interior a nice crust on the outside very tasty with a nice sourdough flavor. Well, as I said earlier on in the video, if you don't have a sourdough culture of your own and you think you'd like to try it, follow the instructions, I guess, that will are down below the video here. I've also written out the uh, instructions for making the, the entire loaf, even, even if you're not using the the uh, basket that I use to to mold it in. You can do it in any large bowl or whatever. So, I'll get this up on on YouTube and thank you very much for watching.